Hello and welcome to Shades and Justice Podcast. This is your host, Dr. Evelyn Hill. You can always catch me at www.drevelynhill.net. Hey, we are excited to be here on this evening with Positive Power 21 uh, radio and podcast. And we're just excited to have a very special guest and a dear friend that I just met about a year ago, Miss Carly Mitchell. Welcome, Miss Mitchell. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. Well, thank you for being here with us. Before we get started, because I think it's really important that people understand that Shades and Justice uh, is a biblically based uh, opportunity where we share injustices that's happening in our society and we as the body of Christ can do something about it. And so I want to share this one scripture, which is Isaiah chapter one and verse 17 that says, learn to do right, seek justice, defend the oppressed, take up the cause of the fatherless, and plead the case of the widow. And uh, I think that's an excellent verse because so often in our urban communities, many of our children are fatherless. We have many senior citizens that are widows or widowers. And we have many that have been oppressed by systems that cause barriers that hinder folks from being helped especially those in disenfranchised communities. So we just bring attention to that. It doesn't matter what denomination, doesn't matter what church, we're all here together trying to do the work of the Lord. And so tonight, Carly, you are a special guest and has a very unique story, uh, especially uh, for someone from your age group. I'm, I'm amazed that the work that you have done and the work that you still do in our community. So before I spill the beans, mm -hmm. Carly, would you tell us just a little bit, first of all, about where you work, how long you've been there or any of those uh, statistics. And then after that, share a little bit about your story. Excuse me. Okay, so um, again, my name is Carly Mitchell. Um, and I currently work with the city of Kansas City. Um, I work a lot in collaboration with KCPD to identify and support individuals with a high risk of retaliation. Um, so the program that I'm currently working for is called Partners for Peace, and it is a fairly new program. It is uh, a, about a year old now. Um, Partners for Peace was, is, was created pretty much to be like NOVA. We had NOVA um, a number of years ago, which Chief Oakman, who is the chief, well, Chief Oakman in Wyandotte County, um, was not the chief at that time, but chief in Wyandotte County now, um, was very instrumental in NOVA at the time. Um, there were very promising results uh, when when Nova uh, was in its full capacity. Uh, the last year that Nova was operating, uh, homicides were down about thirty percent. Um, that is a huge percent given the high number that Kansas City already experiences. Um, Carly, so, do, do, do you mind me just jumping in? What is Nova? Does the, is that uh, acronym? for for something could you explain that to our audience yes and i apologize i just always i think you know that lingo lingo was second nature to you so you don't really explain that and i apologize about that nova is was was the no violence alliance um and so what that was was a collaboration of law enforcement the prosecutor's office the mayor's office um, council, community, and grassroots organizations, as well as schools. Um, so with collaboration, um, they found more results as, in terms of violence prevention, because as we know, um, two people's problems are not going to be the same, even if the outcome is the same, right? So if we have two different offenders, 
um, the reason why John did something is going to be greatly different than James is, mm -hmm. did. So. Okay. Wow. Uh, no violent alliance. That is awesome. Um, and so in your uh, tenure with uh, Kansas City, Missouri, another organization you worked with was Ad Hoc Group Against Crime. So there you are again, right in the middle of some very violent stuff. So tell us a little bit about your experiences while being on the Ad Hoc Group Against Crime. Yeah, so uh, with Ad Hoc, um, Actually, prior to working with Ad Hoc, I worked in private practice in Olathe. Um, I was working on my master's degree in clinical mental health counseling, and um, I was working, again, I was working at, at a practice in Olathe, Kansas. Um, uh, about a year into working in private practice, I had a friend that was murdered, um, and when that happened, it pretty much opened my eyes to all of the violence that was in the city. Not that I was naive to it. Um, however, being far removed from, uh, you know, the city that I was born and raised, grew up in, um, it, it's easy to overlook those things until you are directly impacted by it. Um, sadly, especially if you're not living in the city. Um, so when that happened, I, I literally prayed that day, um, because I felt like I needed to do something bigger than what I was doing. I am still a huge mental health advocate. And however, I feel that my voice could be used to advocate for people that can't advocate for themselves going forward. And so I felt like that was my, that was the pull to ad hoc. Um, so after I prayed, I think it was like three weeks later to the day that I saw the posting for the job for ad hoc. And I had never even considered like, you know, any of that type of work before, but I was like, you know, I'm just going to go off on a whim and I'm going to do this. So I started, um, I was a community resource advocate, um, Myself and uh, my work colleague, we were both community resource advocates. So we would support families um, that have it had their family member has sustained, um, you know, gun violence, homicides, and things like that. Um, after working there for a little while, um, I also started responding to KU Hospital when a victim between the age of 13 and 24 was impacted by gun violence. And so I worked with the Kansas City, Kansas side, um, Thrive, um, Dr. Uh, Jamila Watson Thompson um, in that realm, um, which was very beneficial. Um, I think it was very important to show care and concern for people in those moments. Uh, there's a lot of distrust in systems, um, even hospitals, historically um, medical settings with African-Americans. So having that comfort there at that time, I feel like was very important. Um, so that is that, that was really my journey with Ad Hoc. Um, I really loved it. I love the work that I do, I do and still do. It's, it's very fulfilling. Well, thank you for sharing that. And um, I know that in talking with you in the past, when you, you may get a call at midnight or 2 a.m. in the morning to actually befriend the victim's family. Can you share a little bit about uh, those experiences or how do you prepare yourself to even go out at that time of night and accomplish what you do. So the preparation it takes to even have that mindset. And then what do you say to these families that have just experienced the murder of a son or a daughter? Um, that is a really great question. And um. I actually would never know what to say initially. Um, you know, I would never go into a situation and say, this is the script that I'm going to say, even if I knew like 
full well what happened in a situation. And most of the times uh, with KU, I knew the whole entire situation. Um, the whole case report was given to me. So I knew all of the background information um, when it came to that. I think the homicide scenes were a lot different um, in terms of that because tensions are a lot greater at homicide scenes. While there is still anger in the hospital, their loved one is still alive, right? Like their loved one is still there. They're still yeah. able to communicate with those their th those loved ones. Preparing to go to a homicide scene, no matter what time of day it is, was always very challenging. Um, the mo the ch the I think the ch the most challenging scene that I ever uh, went to uh, was on Hardesty. And um, there was, um, there was, a, it was a gun, one gun involved, the, a small child, he was about six or seven, picked up the gun, it wasn't on safety, and one bullet literally killed a two-month-old baby and the father. So it, you know, it was, it was purely an accident, right? Like it wasn't obviously a targeted um, act of violence. Um, however, I saw so much blame. I saw so much anger, um, you know, just assumption at that scene. And it just made me so sad because I'm like, we're literally like, there's a two, two month old that just, just got shot, you know? So it's like to be able to, to see how people can't put those things aside, really show me that there's a lack of skills that our community needs, right? Like conflict resolution, communication mm -hmm. skills, like mm -hmm. those things are a huge lack. And so um, it just, it was really, it's really sad. And also working with a partner in situations like that really helped because there would be times to me mentally that I might not feel like I was able to handle this situation, especially a lot of situations involving children. And although my partner had children, I think men take things are able to compartmentalize things a lot different. Like as women, we're just so emotional, right? So yeah. there would be times where I might have felt like I can't handle this. And so then he would be able to step in that role for me to fill in. And I think that's really important to be able to have that support system in this work. Um, mm -hmm. I say often that it is a very thankless and silent area to work in. However, it is a very loud, loud um, field to work in, you know, so it is. And, and, and it's very needed. Who, yeah. who would do that? Uh, these are horrific uh, accidents and acts of crime mm -hmm. and somebody has to be able to go in and talk to these families and help these families after they have been victimized by a crime or an accident mm -hmm. and uh, I got a couple of questions about this case she said one bullet killed both the two-month-old and the father Mm -hmm. So did the bullet like go through both of them and it was just. Yeah. So, so basically it was, it, in retrospect, it was, it, the, um, the mom was holding the baby, right? Like okay. baby asleep in the arms right uh -huh. here. And dad was like on mom too. Right. Okay. So it was like, that's how it was. Um, wow. And going, even going to the funeral, um, mm -hmm. I, you know, the, there, that, those, a couple of funerals really, really got me. That was one of, one funeral that got me. We didn't even actually stay, but seeing a casket like that small, like really was very hard for me. Um, mm -hmm. And we also went to a funeral of a mother that had she had five children and i i mean the there was a there was a eight year old and i distinctively remember because my daughter was eight and so like she just got on the microphone and was like 
I don't know what I'm going to do without my mom. I wish I can jump in the casket with her. And, you know, that it, it, it just shows you the ripple effect of violence. Like it, of course, is going to affect the child, but her statement affected everybody in that room, right? Like every oh, yeah. nephew Absolutely. in that room. So it, it's yeah. like, you know, and I, I, I didn't realize how, how, um, how much violence does affect so many people, right? I was mm -hmm. talking to, um, you know, saying I had a partner ad hoc, I was talking to Curtis one time and I was like, you know, I guess I never really realized how, how much like one situation can create trauma for so many different groups, right? Mm -hmm. Like this is like the nurses, the doctors, the people that's checking yes. you in, like the EMTs, like the neighbors, um, the people that's running the insurance claims, like all, like, I'm like, it is so multifaceted like mm -hmm. it, it is just it's mind-blowing and I never thought about that and I mean and not saying that you know like it's, I was just oblivious to it but I just didn't think that deeply about it and I mm -hmm. it, it just it makes me want to fight even harder for you know decrease in in violence so yeah um Wow, that is some kind of story. And the the eight year old saying that that would have messed me up too if I had I been at that funeral. So it's interesting to me that you're at you immediately at the scene of the crime after it has happened to kind of help the the victim's family, and then you even follow up. And you're even at the funeral. And then after the funeral, do you continue to serve those families? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So what, you know, and everybody's timeline is different. Some people, um, some people just need that support during the funeral. Um, some people need that support longer. I think it just really depends on the person. It depends on the relationship. It depends on so many factors. I actually, although I am no longer with ad hoc right now, I am still working with a family that I um, worked with when I was at ad hoc. And not okay. that ad hoc can't um, efficiently help this person. This is this work. And these experiences are very traumatic to people. Explaining your story over and over and over and over again to no avail and to not receive um, the support that you need can get really exhausting to people, creates PTSD in, in individuals, um, re-victimizes, um, and that is not something that I feel good about. So I, mm -hmm. you know, I always let my clients know, like, I'm here for you. And I, some clients take advantage of that. Some clients don't. And, you mm -hmm. know, that's, that's no fault of their own where I, I never pressure anybody for things like that. But if someone feels comfortable with me, that makes me feel happy that I can be a voice to them, that I can just be an ear, that I can support them in ways. And in, that is why I value a lot of my community relationships so that I can get things done for them when they do need them, because mm -hmm. that is, pivotal. Wow. Okay. So in your work, um, you kind of pose in like two or three different lenses. You are a therapist for mental health. Then you have that caregiver spirit. Then you have that investigative thing happening and you're able to do follow-up. Uh, and you also uh, see about not just their mental health, but even their physical health. I, I just sense you do all of that. And uh, that's amazing. That's that's a lot of work. And it takes a heck of an emotional fortitude on your behalf to do that for like several different people. Now, what do you do to take care of you? Uh, your your emotional needs. Uh, I heard you say you work with a partner and the it, for those cases that are a little bit challenging for you. But then afterwards, after you've taken care of everybody else, 
how do you take care of you and your family? I uh, that is that I love that question because um I'm even the way that I'm taking care of myself now has actually shifted from like working at ad hoc because I don't have a partner anymore. So there is um <clears throat> There's obviously a high level of concern that my family and friends feel about me and the work that I do because I am alone. Now, before there was not that high of a level of concern because I had a partner who was a male who does, you know, present naturally like a protector, right? Like right, you know right. him. So it's like you, it, it just, it took away that, that, that feeling for me to even feel nervous in any situation. And I, I say this all the time to people in the work that I do. I'm not scared to go into any situation. I honestly don't care what someone did like that. I I, I don't want to be the person to judge somebody for that. I'm here to help you. I don't, you know, whatever you did is whatever you did. Of course, it's nice to know what they did going into situations blindly by myself. Of course, it, it is nice to know. I, I'm not, I don't fear um, the work that I do in the individuals that I meet with because I feel like my path is already ordered and whatever is going to happen to me, whatever like my path is, is going to be my path. So I'm going to enjoy life to the fullest and I'm going to give to the fullest to my clients despite anything else, because that is what they deserve. I, they don't deserve me to come in here and be scared. Like they can feel that they can sense that a lot of people that are like gang involved and all of those things, they know, right. They know, like they could tell. So there's no reason for me to go in here and do a disservice to somebody that I'm here to service. So fear is not, is not really something that I think about um, because I want to be able to fully serve. Now, I do read a lot. I do have to read a lot of things that are not um, obviously the best things for your mental health to read, see things. Um, and what I do for myself um, to keep myself grounded and to keep myself pretty much in line with that is um, for sure, every single night I write down, um, I have a jar and I write down something that I was grateful for, for the day. Now I could have had the world's worst day in the world. Like it could have been completely terrible. However, I feel like if I, um, if the last thought in my mind is a positive thought, I'm going to get a better night's sleep. I'm going to be more calm. I'm going to be more, adjusted. Um, so if I even write down, I had a wonderful cup of coffee today. That is me just reminding myself that no matter how bad that day was, you had a really great cup of coffee at Cafe uh -huh. for Zone. Like that coffee was amazing. Like, and so I, that is, that's one of the things that I do daily. I also oh, do shit. Legos. Um, I'm a huge Lego fanatic. Um, I have a whole display case in my, uh, in my extra room back there. And for me, it takes my mind off of everything because all I'm doing is focusing on the next block. Like I'm not thinking about anything else, like, because I can't, because I have to follow the directions or it won't mm -hmm. turn out right. So mm -hmm. that is, a, it's a very mindless yet fulfilling activity for me to do. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, I do Legos. And lastly, at least once a month, I do go to the getaway house. Um, it is in Osceola, Missouri. It's a little cabin. Um, I go there for one night and I disconnect and um, just, just, like turn off both of my phones. It's a lot to have two phones, you know, it, you know, so just turn <laughs> off my phones, just focus, read, um, and just relax. And so I try, I make very intentional time for myself because it's very important. So. Oh, that is, that is good. I, the only thing I absolutely could not do is Legos. I usually try to throw as many of them away as possible. So because they just, I remember they were just all over everywhere. So um, thank you for sharing that. And thank you for taking care of you. What, 
what a phenomenal amount of responsibility that uh, is on your shoulders with those families and and your job and then your own family. Um, uh, you shared a story with me, which was a personal uh, story about um, a season when uh, you felt like some things were not justified when there you experienced an injustice from the police department um, in the community at that time. And uh, so often many people in our community have experienced injustices and they go unnoticed, nobody voices it, you're scared to say anything to the police department. And I feel like it's time now that we do a better job of uh, uh, reporting when police uh, are out of line. I, and, and, and granted, I appreciate every police officer that is about being, a, a, you know, uh, upholding the law. I appreciate that. And I appreciate their years of service. They put their life on the line for all of us here in the community. But the bad apples out there, uh, I, I wish we could throw, throw them out. I mean, uh, so those are the types of instances where we need to speak up. Our voices need to be heard about the injustices that are happening to us in our community. So I'm gonna give you uh, uh, the mic to share your story of when you felt like you were terribly um, put in a position of injustice. Yeah, so um, <laughs> growing up, I never had any like negative experiences with the police we lived in a a, a pretty um mixed community um middle income community uh i grew up in the waldo area in kansas city missouri so um there was not a lot of police presence necessary so I didn't have very many interactions with police besides when they would come to school and talk about dare and things like that um, I did hear a lot of negative stories from whether it was from family members or um, schoolmates. Um, so I felt fortunate that I'd never had to deal with that. Um, the situation that I had regarding the police happened when I was 27 years old. And I, that is to me, in my opinion, in my experience with, especially now with the work that I do, that is a older age to have a negative experience with, mm -hmm. with the police. Um, and I think that was one of the reasons why it caught me off guard and made me so angry. Um, I, at the time, um, I was living in Chicago, um, Illinois, but I was at, I was home because I was visiting my dad. So I was in Missouri. I was visiting my dad and I had to drive back to Chicago because I had to go to a doctor's appointment because I was eight months pregnant. I shouldn't have been driving anyway, but that's besides the point, but that long of a drive, but and I was by myself. Um, so I was eight months pregnant and I was driving back to Chicago because I needed to get to the, my doctor's appointment. Well, I um, got pulled over. I was not speeding. I had a Mustang and I was a black woman. So that was the first time in my mind where I was, I felt targeted instantly because I had a nice car um, and I was a black woman. And so I hate that. I can really say that I hate that my mind went to that thought first. Like, I was like, wow, wow. Like, okay, so I'm getting pulled over because I'm in a nice vehicle and I'm a black woman. However, I honestly thought that the police would have sympathy, like not even sympathy. I thought they would just look at me and, you know, I'm going to give them my story. I'm on my way to Chicago. I'm clearly can see my stomach is very pregnant. Well, I had a warrant in St. Louis, St. Charles County um, from four years prior to that. 
that I didn't, I, I totally forgot about it. They sent it to a different address because I'd moved. And so I just forgot about it. Um, so I had a warrant for a speeding ticket. The ticket was eight miles over the speed limit. So to me, I'm like, I pose no threat. I've never been to jail. I've never been arrested. Ne don't have a criminal history. Um, besides this warrant that I had, they treated me like I was a mass murderer. So they took me out the car. They towed my car. They towed my car. I was almost, I was like on the border of um, Ill like Illinois and Missouri. So like East St. Louis. So they towed my car. They extradited me to St. Charles County. They handcuffed me, everything. We got to the station. They Wait, hold up. They handcuffed you and you were eight months pregnant? Yes. Oh my. Yes. Handcuffed me. When we got to um, St. Charles County uh, Detention Center, they stripped me completely naked. Um, they um, searched every cavity in my body. Um, and it was the most humiliating, embarrassing, non-validating experience I have ever experienced in my life. And um, I had to put an orange jumpsuit on, like lit for a ticket that I went eight miles over for, right? The police department talks about how there's a lack of, of officers, how there's a lack of resources. Though that, to that, that day, that did not demonstrate that because there's bigger fish to fry than arresting an eight month pregnant woman who's on the way to a doctor's appointment. That was, that was a poor use of resources. And so it's, it, even in my education and even in me working with police, it's, it's hard for me sometimes to believe the things that they say because of what, like I experienced. Mm -hmm. And so even though that you, they can't take people to jail for that anymore. Um, since I was that almost 10 years ago now, um, it was, it was still a very degrading experience. I, I told myself I, I would never, ever, ever speak to a police officer ever again. And so I, you know, I think it's so funny because I'm like, God is always like, yeah, you think you got a plan, but actually I'm going to make this full circle for you. Um, because now I work so closely with the police. Um, I go to shoot review, I get all of most of my referrals from KCPD and there are good people in the police department. However, on it, just to be honest, I think that there are more bad apples in the police department than there are good apples. And so it is still really a struggle for me. However, I like to get in systems so I can shake them up. I like to get in systems so I can hold people accountable. I like to get in systems so I can challenge policy. I like to get in systems so the next person won't have to work as hard as I did to get things done because the police is interfering with things. So that to me, that's my, that is my quote unquote payback for what happened. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm gonna get into the system and I'm gonna see these true colors and I'm gonna hold you accountable and it's it's not going to be pretty so let and so that is kind of like i feel like my journey was full circle with that mm -hmm. that is an amazing story uh because uh we've seen here within the last i want to say three years uh three to five years we've seen a couple of stories on the Kansas City, Missouri side where pregnant women have been arrested, handcuffed, and even thrown on the ground. And uh, mm -hmm. I just do not believe police should get away with that. I, I think that's, that's a sensitivity issue that needs to be addressed. Um, and uh, the woman was not, these, these women that I saw, uh, were not in a criminal act at all. They may have had a lot of mouth on them, yeah. but uh, they were not like holding guns or doing, you know, or knives or anything like that. So uh, I, I'm glad you're in 
in the system uh, with your voice for those that will never get to speak. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you so much for your work. Um, there's been so many homicides on both sides of the county line, both Missouri and Kansas, but quite a few more on the Missouri side. And that's mainly <laughs> where you work. And so I'm just wondering two things. Number one, how can we as parents, young parents with kids um, what can we do what can we say to help our teenagers and our and uh, our middle school age kids what what can parents do to kind of help them so they are not victims of their own neighborhood or community what would you suggest carly uh that is i i can probably talk about that for hours. Um, but there's a couple of things though. Um, it's going to take a lot because there is distrust in the community with, as far as police, right? Mm -hmm. And so one thing that I think would work um, to prevent violence is to call every time someone hears gunshots it is the police literally tell you to call the police but people don't do that however i what i try to do is tell people you should because like they're going to have a paper trail like you can't you cannot you can't really go against facts right like so you can say all day and all night every single it's been 365 days in this year and i think i've heard gunshots 360 days well you're you, there's no even though that may be true it could be a hundred percent valid but if there is no documentation if there is no um paper trail for that you're you don't have a basis so in order to have a basis you have to have a basis call the police. I like call. I, I tell people all the time. I'm like, if you hear a gunshot, just call. Hey, I heard a uh, gunshots to the east of me. Like keep calling, keep calling. Because if you keep calling, they're going to identify like, okay, these places are experiencing this. These places are experiencing this. These places are experiencing this. If not, it's going to keep happening, but it does. It people don't call because they don't trust the police. They do not trust the police. I sat down with a family today that I sat down with a family that I actually carved out an hour for, but I ended up spending four hours with them. She, the mother is so upset with systems because she called the police and it took the ambulance 45 minutes to get there to her son. And her son was still breathing when she called the ambulance. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's like, it's so, I tell them, even though I work closely with law enforcement, like EMS, it's hard for me to advocate for you if you were really not doing your job. And that's why I said, I, I'm glad that I'm in the system because I don't hold back. I will literally say that to someone, you know, and it it is very hard, like I said, to advocate for them when you're you're dropping the ball. And I, I don't want to hear about there's a shortage of funding, all of that. There, there's problems in every situation. So what do we do in the meantime? Like you can't just keep saying we're short staffed. We're okay, so let's yeah. let's come up with a better solution in the meantime. Let's mm -hmm. let's come up. You can't just keep saying that, you know. So I'm like, so that's number one, community trust from both, from both, from both, from community mm -hmm. needs to trust uh mm -hmm. police and police needs to trust community point blank. Uh -huh. Also, skills that are not taught in school that should be taught in school are, I feel like are a major reason why there is the rate, the age range is uh, decreasing. Um, kids are not taught how to regulate emotions. Kids are not taught how to resolve conflicts. Mm -hmm. Kids are not taught how to walk away because you're going to look like a punk you're going to be mm -hmm. this for the rest of your life. Kids are not taught like 
de-escalation tactics, they, they're not taught that at all. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I say that to a lot of the young people that I work with, like you can be making straight A's, like you can be the best student or whatever, but when you get out into this workforce and you don't know how to handle a conflict, you're not, you're going to be a liability to this mm -hmm. company. So th mm -hmm. it doesn't matter if you have a perfect GPA, if you can write grants, from the feet to the all the way down if you mm -hmm. can if you don't have those basic skills you're not you're not an asset to to mm -hmm. society because you're not you're not doing what you should be doing so we see in Kansas City we are at we are at we are tied with the highest rate of homicides we had our highest rate was in 2020 so we are at 167 right now which is tied again with the highest year the number one reason uh that is highlighted for homicides is conflict conflict mm -hmm. conflict yeah conflict wow conflict yeah conflict. And so we really got to get a handle on how do we handle conflict. So it's not just the kids. It's the adults handle. too. It's the, yeah, the, exactly. It's it's it is it. And it's in it's in the political arena. It's in the church. It's at the schools. It's in our neighborhoods. It's in our communities. It's in our city halls. Everywhere we look, there is conflict. And it's so easy to blame the next person instead yes. of all of us yes. figuring out a way, how can we learn how to work together? doesn't mean we agree on everything, but we don't have to we pull have out to knives be, and yes. guns and start slashing people's tires and busting wheel windshields and cars. We don't have to do that. No. There is a better way. So thank you for, for bringing that point out. Uh, we all have to do a better job of uh, handling conflict. And I, uh, and we'll talk about this at the next time, I actually offer a conflict class that I've taught. And I think you do teaching with conflict resolution also. So it's plenty out there for us to learn. And uh, so thank you for sharing that. that that's pretty awesome. Uh, I got a couple more things I just want to ask you about. Um, uh, the Breonna Taylor case has come up again uh, because uh, one of the officers that went in and shot up both her apartment and the apartment next door uh, is on trial again. In my opinion, they all should have went to jail. In my opinion, most of them didn't. And to me, that is a huge era of injustice. That's in my opinion. Yeah. I'm not a police officer, but I am a mother and I believe in justice. Yeah. And if I went in shooting up a house, uh, even though I was considered a police officer, I don't think I would have got away with it. No. I think I would have been... Uh, at least had a decent trial. I think the di the uh, district attorney's office would have definitely wanted to charge me with the crime. Mm -hmm. But these guys, in my opinion, got away with murder. Uh, and that's, I'm not even talking about uh, Viola Davis and that TV show, How to yeah. Get Away with Murder. We, yeah. This is just in your face, injustice, in my opinion. So, uh, one of the questions I wanted to ask you was the no-knock warrant. Now, here in Kansas City, Kansas, we did check with the police department here, and they no longer have the no-knock yep. warrant. And they what do. about the Kansas City, Missouri side? So, um, so the no-knock, it, it's the same in Missouri as well. So the no-knock warrant stopped. Uh, they stopped it in 2020. However, um, police are still able to stop people if they have, and I'm air quoting this, reasonable cause. So in reasonable cause is not defined in that law. There's no like reasonable cause is if 
this person's light is missing or they're not wearing a seatbelt. Like there's, there's no, there's no like Webster's dictionary breakdown of what reasonable cause is to police. Reasonable cause is reasonable cause to that person. So my reasonable yeah. cause may be different than your reasonable cause because of our separate experiences. I may pull over a black man because I've been victimized by a black man and that in my mind, that's reasonable cause. You might pull over a white man because you have been victimized by a white man and that is your reasonable cause. It And so it is still a very gray area to me. It doesn't, it, it's still the no, not cause. Like it's still the no, not thing. Like it, that's still right. what it is because you can't say it's no longer. However, unless police have reasonable suspicion that this person is going to cre uh, is going to have like commit a violent act how can how there's no one in like you can't predict if someone is going to have a a violent act and first of all police are not even trained for that at all you're not you're not they're not trained to to guess if someone is going to have a violent act i don't know right. Like even as a even as a mental health expert, like you are sitting in a room with a, a client for multiple months and you can't you don't know for sure if this person right. is going to do a violent act, even right. though you have been trained in body language and tone and action, like all of those things, you know, everything in the DSM that like all of these things you still do not know. So that doesn't make sense to me. I don't, I I really, I'm not for like, I just don't think it makes sense because it's still the same thing. So let me, let me tell you all that we're getting rid of the no knock, but an officer can stop somebody if they have reasonable, reasonable cause. And, and let's explain what a no knock warrant is. It's when a police officer can bang in your door without no, knocking, yep, without, without no. letting you know yep. that they're police. They don't even have to wear a uniform. They that don't. was, uh, so uh, it, it's just, it, it's it's unjust. That's the yep. nicest way I can say it. It is unjust. And so we have developed good relationships with police officers yep. here in KCK and you have both on the Missouri side and the Kansas side. But there are still issues out there that we still need to address as a community. And uh, with uh, so much going on, uh, we, we want to make sure that our voices continue to be heard. And, uh, you know, all while I was growing up, I heard Proverbs chapter 31 talking about the virtuous woman. But nobody ever read this scripture to me. Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. This is Proverbs 31, 8 and 9. For the rights of all who are destitute, speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and needy. So yes. over and over again, the people that you have worked with are those that have been oppressed, yes. those who are needy those that are fatherless it's just so thank you for the work that you do and and we've got to continue to to work together i know you worked with me with the justice and equity coalition we're going to be making some changes in that and i'm going to call you again to see if you can help us with some of those changes but one of the things we did was approach the police department to look at policies that could be changed. And we were successful in getting them changed. But it's just like you said, some of the wording still leaves some gray areas mm -hmm. where they can still do what they want to do yep. because of reasonable cause yep. or clause. So, wow. All right. Well, uh, Thank you, Carly. What an exciting uh, episode we had on today. Is there are there any final words you'd like to say before we end our session? No, I just appreciate you even considering me. Um, I'm very passionate 
about this work. And so um, just any chance that I can get to talk about it, bring awareness um, to a lot of the dis disparities that I see in the, the victims and families that I work with, um, I just love to highlight it because I'm a huge advocate for that. So um, I really appreciate you having me on today. Well, thank you, Carly. And we appreciate you being out there in the public, uh, working with those victims. Uh, you are fearless. I, I, I know mm -hmm. we can't call you superwoman or anything like that, but that that's just all you need is a big S, you know, <laughs> That's all you need, but we appreciate you. And we know that the Lord is using you in great ways. And I want to encourage others that have a passion to do something. Don't just sit down and do nothing and just do Facebook and Twitter and all that. Get out of the house and do something for the Lord. Do something for our other sisters and brothers. Be a comfort, be a word of encouragement along the way. So again, this is Dr. Evelyn Hill with Shades and Justice. Our special guest today was Carly Mitchell. And hey, you can catch me anytime at www.dreveleynhill.net. Until next time. Bye.